Oh, next is the laryngeal paralysis. So laryngeal paralysis, I told you, it occurs in uh, dogs like uh, Labrador retrievers, larger breeds, or uh, Huskies, or uh, Dalmatians. Laryngeal paralysis are very common. Where this arytenoid cartilage fail to abduct, abduct in the sense they fail to open up during inspiration, and therefore it is closed always, and the respiration, the respired air cannot enter into the epiglottis. So this is the biggest problem in uh, dogs. So on exercise or on excitement, they have severe inspiratory striders. So the sound will be like this. <coughs> it's very difficult for me to express that. If you, if you hear the sound from a distance, or when you walk an animal in, the, in your clinic, you give, or when you stimulate the, you know, uh, la larynx or trachea, if this sort of sound is going to inspiratory striders are going to be there, then it is highly suggestive of laryngeal paralysis. See, the breed is, signalment is very important. If you see these signs in the case of Labrador retrievers or in the case of, uh, you know, um, uh, Dalmatians, or if you see them in Huskies, your diagnosis will be uh, definitely right. So again, here also uh, oxygen therapy, external cooling, because most of the times these uh, you know episodes will be there because of severe, severe uh, environmental temperature is high. These uh, things will uh, get triggered. Excitement, all these things will trigger uh, the episodes of uh, inspiratory striders. So external cooling, sedation, assisted breathing. Assisted breathing is by either intubating or doing a tracheostomy. Then the surgical procedure which is done is arytenoid laterization. It's called tieback surgeries. I really do not know who's doing in India, but this is straightforward, simple technique where the arytenoid uh, membrane, uh, cartilage is uh, sutured to the surrounding tissue. Usually only unilateral uh, arytenoid lateralization is done so that one is uh, remaining uh, normal so that this will give way for the inspired air to go inside. So the only problem with this uh, you know, tie back surgery is you know, the, whenever they drink water, they can get aspirated and these problems we will we'll have to think about when we are doing this tie back surgeries. So uh, treatment, you can give uh, doxepin because uh, these dogs, when they are very anxious, they go into this problem. So this is a tricyclic uh, antidepressants, doxepin. You can go into 0 0.5 to 1 milligram per kg body weight twice daily. Curcumin powder is an anti-inflammatory uh, used commonly. So that's called, so got excellent uh, results in, uh, you know, uh, you'll be surprised to see that you know, most of the uh, foreign veterinarians, they use alternative medicine much more than Indian veterinarians. But whereas we are the most powerful people with uh, this sort of, uh, uh, you know, Ayurvedic preparations and uh, plant-based alternative medicine, which we do not uh, attach importance to. As the days are coming, we need to attach more importance to this sort of alternative medicines. Curcumin uh, powder is excellent anti-inflammatory properties. Honey is an excellent option for cough management in whatsoever disease, not only in uh, this sort of uh, paralysis. Honey can be given. Lycorice is another plant-based, uh, you know, product, which you can always try in these sort of uh, uh, cases. Back surgeries, you can see that um, arytenoid uh, cartilage is uh, sutured to the surrounding tissue so that uh, you know, it will not come in the way of uh, swam problem. Next is a tracheal collapse. So as I told you, signalment is very, very important. As you see uh, laryngeal paralysis in large breeds like Labradors, Dalmatians, and the, uh, Huskies, tracheal collapse is seen in smaller breeds like Pomeranians, Shih Tzus, okay, and, uh, you know, Yorkshire Terriers. So whenever you get typical goose on cough, which you hear as the dog is entering into your clinic, you know it is tracheal collapse. Okay, the, the sound will be just like this. This is a goose song sound, which 
Is there any question? If it does this sort of wrong sound, then it is a uh, real gaze, uh, no trivial class. Start trying to hear this sound, you must be talking, but you Dr. have to have not your voice. Yes. Your voice is little disturbed. The time you uh, tried to mimic the <laughs> voice, after that we couldn't listen. So if you can repeat it once again, I'm really sorry. I'll do that. Sorry, it's beginning like that. Okay. Okay, fine. In trachea collapse, as the dog enters the uh, hospital, you get a good song sound. <laughs> this this is called good song uh, cough. This is very typical of tracheal collapse. And I told you the um, this is very important. Signalment is very important in breeds less than ten kilos, which are like a Pomeranians or a Shih Tzus or Yorkshire Terriers. When you have hear these sort of sounds. Uh, Shua was all these uh, breeds are highly prone for tracheal collapse. And when you see them uh, cough like this, the goose on cough, you know it is tracheal collapse. To start with, when you are seeing these sounds, you might be confused. Okay, so, because it can be uh, even a cardiac problem. So you should have, at least you should be having tracheal collapse in your differential diagnosis. You can have because it's a inspiratory, uh, you know, sound which you are hearing. You should also have it. You will also have it in a cardiac problem. Similar cough on a tracheal, uh, bron uh, you know, bronchial disease. Also, you will have similar. The mild uh, differences, which I will try to uh, mimic again when I show you that. So, but you should have them in your, uh, you know, differential diagnosis. Okay, With this, you know, the trachea becomes uh, narrowed uh, either in the uh, proximal part on the lat, uh, uh, caudal part. It uh, narrows, and you have this condition. You know, what actually happens, we, nobody knows, but it, it's a very progressive degenerative condi condition in middle-aged toy breeds, okay? So occasionally congenital also. The medical treatment is, uh, you know, when the patients have uh, been diagnosed with uh, tracheal uh, collapse, I mean, uh, yeah, collapse, so you should avoid all airborne allergens or irritants, dust in the house, you will have to use, uh, you know, um, uh, machines which collect dust. There are a lot of machines which, uh, you know, collects. Uh, it's not very expensive. The, the, those things have to be used. Smokers should be avoid uh, smoking inside the house. All these things are very important when you have because the moment you smoke, the smoke will uh, start, uh, you know, aggravating the uh, cough. Then identify and minimize the exacerbating factors, weight loss. First, remove the collar, um, uh, collar and use a, a chest harness. Keep the dog in a cool environment without anxiousness. All these things are all medical management of this uh, tracheal collapse. And sometimes you can manage them for a long time with medical management. And you can use bronchodilators like theophylline, ephedrines, antitussives like butyrophenol, hydrocodone, okay, then sedatives like azipromazine, then corticosteroids to reduce air, air uh, way inflammations. And of course, antibiotics are not required. But in case where you, you have a secondary inflammation and secondary bacterial problem, and if you have a leukocytosis or you have fever, then probably you can add antibiotic to this regimen. So you can use uh, you know the, all those drugs which reduce the anxiety in the small breeds of dogs. There is one thing called rescue. Rescue remedy. It's available in Amazon. Rescue remedy you can use. Glucosamine, how it uh, helps, we really don't know, but glucosamine is, uh, stops the progression of this disease. So honey, again, as I told you, is very good for all cough-related problems, giving uh, about half a teaspoon of uh, honey, of course, in a small breed, still less, uh, will uh, definitely make him better. And CBD oil, again, I don't know whether we get CBD oil because it's marijuana. I don't know whether we get in India, but if CBD oil is got at one milligram per 5 kg body weight, an excellent uh, anxiolytic drug. It's also an anti-inflammatory drug. It has got several properties. We'll be very lucky if, um, you know, Ori Heal or uh, such companies come out with this, uh, you know, CBD oil and things like that. For various uh, problems in veterinary, CBD oils can be used. Then alprozolam. Alprozolam, of course, uh, Oriel has got. 
point zero point zero two to one milligram per kg body weight can be given. Of course, uh, tracheal ring prosthesis. This is a surgical uh, option for uh, tracheal collapse. Again, this also you need not think it's a very you know rocket science. You can just use your 5 ml syringe or 3 ml syringe or 2 ml syringe according to the circumference of the trachea of the dog in which you're going to operate. Make thin cuts like this and uh, you know you can suture them outside. From outside you can anchor them and suture them. The only thing you'll have to think, the only problem is laryngeal paralysis because the uh, uh, you know, um, laryngeal nerve passes on by the side of the trachea. So if you know the anatomy and avoid this laryngeal nerve, then it is a very safe uh, surgery. This can be done, or you can put stent. You can put stent. Also, these sort of uh, rings uh, are available in market. Those things can be got, and you can uh, put in different different places according to to what extent it requires. All these things you have to study. So the diagnosis is made by uh, radiography or uh, bronchoscopy or fluoroscopy. Fluoroscopy is a gold standard, and uh, bronchoscopy also is a gold standard where you can grade this tracheal collapse and see if it is to be put on surgery. So this is a tracheal stent which you put endoscopically inside the trachea. So they go and expand and see to that this trachea doesn't collapse while doing, uh, during inspiration. So this is a stent which is used and it's very high time we people in India start doing all these things. As Dr. Sharma was telling, if we can do this sort of procedures which are not rocket science, we can definitely improve, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, foreigners coming to our country for doing this sort of procedures. They're like uh, medical tourism, veterinary medical tourism is not an um, impossibility the coming days. An infectious uh, tracheobronchitis. Uh, this is uh, okay. Most important is a uh, canal cough. Okay, this is uh, because of um, a long uh, drawn problem because of uh, bronchitis. They can get uh, or viral diseases. They will be prone for multiple uh, infective agents. This uh, canal cough occurs, and you know um, uh, it can usually seen in six weeks to six months age. Uh, viral disease and secondary bacterial infections and bordetella is the main organism is thought about but yeah, even other, other than that you can have infectious tracheobronchitis and the cough again i want to mimic cough uh, for this or you know, bronchitis you have a typical cough like this yeah, cough harsh cough followed by retching and gagging like spitting Okay, you understand? The cough followed by retching and gagging is highly suggestive of kennel cough. Okay, infectious tracheobronchitis. You can again, I'll make it. A typical cough will look like this. It will be a harsh cough followed with retching and gagging. Okay. So this sort of cough followed with, because the tracheobronchial phlegm comes in the way and it starts uh, trying to get retching and it tries to take it uh, remove those uh, phlegm and that the spitting action is uh, uh, brought okay the uh, the animal makes the efforts so if this process is seen it is very typical of kennel cough see the the cough before and cough now so slight difference is there so infectious uh, tracheobronchitis and tracheal collapse you may have cough in both, but here is a harsh cough followed by retching and followed by gagging, like spitting. This uh, is very suggestive of infectious tracheobronchitis.
So uncomplicated cases you can just do with potentiated amoxicillin or doxycycline. I always prefer doxycycline in veterinary patients because it is also efficient in so many other diseases which can also be, uh, you know, a differential diagnosis for whatever cause you are seeing. For example, cat, you can also think of uh, toxoplasmosis. So a potentiate amoxicillin with clavulanic acid or doxycycline in uncomplicated cases for tracheobronchitis is very good. In a complicated cases where they have pneumonia and things like that, you'll have to go in for gentamicin, amikacin, endofoxacin, cephalosporins, all these sort of drugs. In case of, uh, I'm giving you at the end of the thing a small table where you give your doses and all. So I have not put the dose here, okay? And, and I, again, I want to tell uh, all these uh, practitioners, all the practitioners, I want to tell you that whenever you choose an antibiotic, see, in veterinary, how many antibiotics you're going to choose? And those antibiotics, you should know do's and don'ts and uh, the dose. If you don't know also, you should refer when you're doing it, when you're giving it. That is very important. Okay? And nebulization with antibiotics like gentamicin or uh, uh, aminoglycosides, again, will improve the treatment response in a case of uh, tracheobronchitis. So cough suppressants like butyrophenol, hydrocodone, and bronchodilate as theophylline will make uh, the response to treatment better. The prevention is the intranasal vaccine. One to Adults, uh, one-time intranasal vaccine, or you can also get a vaccine six to eight weeks and a booster at four months. So this, um, uh, you know, kennel cough vaccines are available both intranasal as well as injectable. You see the protocol for the vaccination so that, and you require this vaccine when you think that your dog is going to go to your shelter or when your dog is going to your show. It is not, uh, you know, this, you don't find, uh, you don't diagnose your case of, uh, you know, uh, kennel cough in a, a pet which is there in a the house, which is not going out. You don't find Okay, only when they go to a uh, pet uh, uh, boarding facilities or it is traveling abroad and coming or it is uh, going to a show and coming, such of those cases is enough because already we are doing a lot of vaccinations. Over and above, you want to give this sort of vaccines. So, you see, vaccine-induced granuloma is another biggest problem in veterinary medicine, which no veterinarian in the world wants to address because it will reduce their income. So, again... To add another uh, protocol of, you know, six to eight weeks and booster four months, you have to have, uh, uh, you know, a judicial uh, uh, to take the vaccine or not, okay? So next is canine chronic bronchitis. Uh, any cough for more than two months, you'll have to think about chronic bronchitis. It can be a harsh, productive or non-productive cough. Sometimes cough can be uh, followed with a syncope. Okay, and uh, when you do a physical examination, you find crackles and wheezes and prolonged respiration and expiratory push. So this is again a very important clinical science, which is uh, lower alveolar disease. When you have expiration, at the end of expiration, you get an abdominal push. Yeah, I know, I'm sorry, uh, later on I'll share a good uh, video where there is, uh, now I'm not able to get that. So you have a prolonged expiration. At the end of expiration, you get abdominal push. This is very characteristic of uh, chronic bronchitis. So diagnosis by radiology, and of course, uh, the, uh, another uh, uh, you know uh, um, colleague of mine is going to talk to you about radiology, donut bronchi, uh, transline pattern, and sometimes you find right side cardiomegaly, bronchoscopy, and uh, bronchial or lavage can give you a final diagnosis. You have seen the video where you have expiratory, uh, you know, striders. So far, whatever you have seen, uh, you know, in a pug and all, as an inspiratory striders, like that. Here you have an expiratory strider. Expiratory strider is a hallmark of lower respiratory tract disease and especially bronchial disease. Okay, this dog probably has a severe bronchial disease or it might be having 
a, a cardiac disease which has made the lung wet and that is the reason it is having uh, expiratory striders. So your differential diagnosis will be uh, bronchial disease, chronic bronchial disease. If it is acute, a cardiac disease, okay? So treatment for this is anti-inflammatories, bronchodilators, antitussives, antibiotics, nebulization, and coupage. What is coupage? I'll tell you, I'll just put a small thing. Coupage is just a massaging, okay? On all the, you know, this uh, uh, dogs which has got where you got, where you think it has got a flum in the bronchio alveoli. Uh, you know, if you do uh, uh, nebulize them with steam and do coupage, coupage is a gentle, gentle massage of the thoracic cavity. They will dislodge this, uh, you know, mucus and pay way for clearance so that gas exchange can happen better. Okay. So this is a centopeptidase tablets which you can use in all inflammatory diseases, the lower respiratory tract where it can reduce inflammation, cause uh, third generation cephalosporins and cases where you require antibiotics in complicated cases. Then pulmonary parenchymal disease. So here you have two things. One is pulmonary edema and a bacteria, no, not exactly bacterial pneumonia, pneumonia. Okay, we'll see. It comes, it can have a bacterial pneumonia or a viral pneumonia. It can be a, a fungal pneumonia. Or, no, or it can be a eosinophilic pneumonia because of parasites, it can be anything. And pulmonary edema is a non-infectious cause of problem in the causing parenchymal disease. So what is pulmonary parenchymal difference? So it's a cardiogenic edema, okay? But typically you see periolar uh, lesions, then you have, see the pulmonary veins are uh, um, broader than the pulmonary arteries. You get murmurs and arrhythmias. We get hypothermias, okay? So typically you require to do a very good uh, cardiac auscultation. So you should know how to do a metral valve, how to do aortic valve, how to do pulmonary valve, on the right side, how to do a tricuspid valve, okay? You keep your palm in the, you know, um, uh, area of um, chest on the lower area near the elbow, you keep. Where you get the apex beat on your palm, if you keep a stethoscope, that is your metral valve. This is what is a basic problem with cardiogenic edema because in this mitral valve, the you know mitral regurgitation after the uh, you know uh, uh, blood from the uh, left atrium comes into the left ventricle. They don't close properly, and the rush of uh, blood from the left ventricle again happens into the left auricle, uh, and that has got a pulmonary hypertension, and it goes in for cardiogenic edema. Okay, and also another problem is the left uh, uh, atrium getting enlarged and pressing the, uh, you know, um, trachea. That also can cause a cough and things like that, okay? So these are all some, see, you, I already told you in the first, most important things, uh, heart and lungs share common signs. So whenever a case comes, first we should def uh, define whether it is a respiratory problem or a cardiac problem. So we should know a physical examination, like, you know, hearing a murmur, or seeing a uh, jugular pulse, or you, uh, you know, these sort of things are very, very, uh, you know, or, uh, you know, femoral pulse or a peripheral pulse, a capillary refill time. If it is going to be hyperdynamic, if it is going to be having a severe uh, tachycardia, it can be a cardiogenic problem. Okay. Then the respiratory problem. So you'll have to rule out first cardiogenic versus uh, respiratory. Then non cardiogenic, you have a cardiodorsal edema. For the top aspect, you have edema. And you have a normal heart and results. And this happens in electrocution, seizures, near drowning. So you don't usually get near drowning, but you get a lot of cases of seizures and electrocution in small puppies. You can put a stethoscope on the cardiodorsal aspect. Cardiodorsal means the, the I'll show you the picture of lung edema, lung auscultation. The right extreme topmost point, you get severe edema in case of electrocution uh, for a, small puppies. You can hear, uh, you know, uh, ex exaggerated uh, alveolar sounds. So uh, pneumonia, where you get uh, exaggerated uh, uh, alveolar sounds in the cranioventral alveolar disease, the cranioventral direction of the pulmonary field. Diffuse patchy disease, of course, it causes uh, fever. Then, of course, it can be a um, uh, contusion or it can be interstitial or a soft tissue neoplasia. All this can cause pulmonary parenchymal disease. 
fibrosis are seen in certain uh, dogs and uh, soft tissues mainly okay diffuse uh, soft tissue problems we will see how to uh, see them things you know you get a cough low pitch cough okay so you will be able to either uh, listen to them with the help of stethoscope or mild uh, this is a typical low pitch cough you find in a pulmonary parenchymal disease and you will have a shallow rapid breathing i'll show you the picture so I'll show you cranioventral, middle lung lobes, aspiration pneumonia, thoraxis, cardiac. I'll just show you the picture itself. So this is, uh, you know, uh, shallow rapid breathing open mouth breathing uh, breathing okay so if, in this case if you stimulate the trachea then you get a small uh, you know uh, soft husky uh, cough from the lower end you know, you'll get One see that is in a biopsy in it. See that the movement on the neck that is called cupular movement. That is significant of the severe lower respiratory tract disease in a cat. Okay. Right, sir. Now, now this is a lung auscultation area where we should uh, see. I always tell you the skill of auscultation should be learned by individual veterinarians, it cannot be taught. Okay. So, because when you put a step first time, you'll get a lot of sounds. Those sounds which produced by the, uh, you know, your uh, uh, diaphragm rubbing the hair, then you uh, you get the sounds of cardiac, then you'll get the sound of intestines, then you'll get the sound of people outside talking. All these sounds will you'll get. But if you target your hearing to the pulmonary sounds, you will train your ears to hear this. Then after some time, you'll be able to pick up the, uh, you know, sounds very easily. So the best thing is to use a stethoscope on all animals which come to you. That's the only way to uh, learn lung auscultation, which cannot be substituted by any test. Okay, so please learn the art of doing auscultation. So from the point of elbow near zephyr cartilage till the 10th rib, you may draw one line. Then the shoulder line, perpendicular line, this triangle is the area for lung auscultation. Okay. So this is the uh, so on uh, left hand side top you have this one zephyr to shoulder one line from zephyr to 10th rib one line and divide the area into nine equal parts okay uh, then when you find a problem in the uh, cranial ventral aspect you get uh, lung sounds then it is aspiration pneumonia okay when you get in the middle of the uh, lung area then it is cardiogenic okay in trauma and seizures, you get on the dorsocaudal, okay, dorsocaudal region, you get the allular sounds, okay. In ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome and uh, neoplasia, you get uniform bronchoallular sounds, okay. So this is how you do a lung auscultation and differentiate it before doing radiology and things like that. Where you don't have radiology and facilities, 
you have to depend on the skill of auscultation. Okay. So cardio, cardiogenic edema, you know, you get a wet lung when the pulmonary vein diameter is more than the pulmonary artery. You get murmur, you get arrhythmias, you get, uh, of course, arrhythmias are common in dogs. So you should not jump to the conclusion that arrhythmia, when you find arrhythmia itself is pathognomonic. Common arrhythmias are also uh, there in dogs, okay? Then severe tachycardia. In a large breed, if you get more than 150, in a small breed, if you get more than 180, then it is tachycardia, okay? Treatment, oxygen, sedatives, morphine, azipromazine, positive pressure ventilation, either with a ventilator or with a ampu bag, diuretics, because it reduces the volume load, bronchodilators to ease the respiration, treatment for hypoproteinemia. See, what is important in this, uh, you know, edema of the lung is, it can be due to hydrostatic pressure or oncotic pressure. If it is hydrostatic pressure, it can be due to post-hepatic portal hypertension, that is cardiac disease, or it can be hepatic uh, portal hypertension because of liver, or it can be pre-hepatic portal hypertension, okay? I don't want to confuse you. So post-hepatic portal hypertension is a cause for pulmonary edema, okay? And for which you'll have to treat the uh, heart. So diuretics, bronchodilators, and if it is oncotic pressure, that is, there's going to be a low protein, either because of, uh, you know, kidney disease or because of protein losing enteropathy. If you have a low protein or because of liver disease, low albumin, you're going to have a very low hypoprotein. You should treat for them, okay? And treat for congestion heart failure. You've got pimobendone, you've got uh, diuretics, you've got uh, lasix, I mean, sorry, uh, enalapryls. All these drugs uh, which are used for treating uh, congestion heart failure, you'll have to use when you see it is pulmonary edema with a strong disposition of a cardiac disease, okay? Okay, next is infectious parenchymal disease. It can be a bacterial pneumonia, it can be a viral pneumonia, it can be a eosinophilic pneumonia, or it can be a fungal pneumonia. So bacterial pneumonia, it can be a bordetella, canal cough, which is very common in dogs. Mycoplasma is very, 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 very important in cats because uh, mycoplasma is, uh, uh, you know, you're always seen in case of uh, other uh, you know, viral disease of cats, you get mycoplasma, and this uh, mycoplasma is a constant carrier. So these dog, these cat people who have more cats, they will regularly come to you with, uh, you know, cats being uh, lethargic, and you know, you, if you do a blood test, it'll be very anemic. Then if you see, it'll have a mycoplasma, okay? So immunosuppressive diseases, sepsis, uh, diabetes mellitus, either Cushing's, hyperadenocardism, or Addison's hypoadrenocardism, all these things can cause severe bacterial pneumonia. Diagnosis, of course, uh, yeah, CBC, the biochemistry, serology, radiography, all these things will tell you what exactly it is. Treatment is, again, as I told you, mainstay is oxygen, antibiotics, nebulization, coupage. These are all the treatment protocols. So this is a coupage. Whenever they, you think there's going to be a bronchial disease or lower respiratory tract disease where you get flum and things like that, you have to do a gentle coupage to uh, disrupt the uh, mucus secretion sticking on to the alveoli so that can be cleared by cough or anything like that. And, uh, you know, you have a natural phenomena of ciliary action which will remove them. So once you uh, help that, uh, you know, by doing a coupage, then that will facilitate you can have a simple saline, uh, you know, you can um, give a, a nebulized, nebulized animal with saline and you can do coupage. Even without anything else, these pets will become better. So toxoplosmosis is a protozoan disease, it's highly zoonotic. Cats are definitely host, warm-blooded animals or intermediate host. So, the, the, you know, I don't want to go into the life cycle of toxoplasmosis. It's very, very complicated. Don't bother about it that. Immunodeficient cats are highly prone. That is the reason I told you any infectious, viral infectious disease of cats, you also get toxoplasma. We should definitely know about this disease. And to those people who have cats, talk to them about this, and you need not scare them because your cat is inside the house, 
is never going to have a problem because they don't transmit toxoplasma. Toxoplasma is got by ingesting raw meat or when the cat goes outside and catches uh, rodents or other cockroaches, they can get, uh, you know, the cyst. Otherwise, uh, there's no chance for a household cat to get. So you have to advise the owner how to keep a cat. And if they leave a cat outside, then they can bring in toxoplasma. So because do not take, okay? And especially pregnant women should be very, very careful. The cats are the definitive host. Warm blood animals are intermediate host. Immunodeficient cats are highly prone. That is the reason I tell you all viral uh, diseases of cats, like infectious uh, uh, peritonitis or infectious feline uh, immunodeficiency virus, all these things will lead on to toxoplasmosis. So the science depends on where the parasite affects. If it affects the respiratory system, you get pneumonia. If it affects the liver, you get jaundice. If it affects the eye, you get uh, anterior uveitis. You get um, uh, keratin precipitate in the cornea. Then you get blindness. You get ipemia. All these things. You get Horner's syndrome. All these things we see in high eye, eye problems. Okay. Your nervous system is affected. You get seizures. You know, you get ataxia. All these things are all commonly seen. Depending on uh, which system is affected, the signs vary. So you cannot rule out toxoplasmosis by seeing only certain pathognomonic signs. So the antibiotic of choice is clindamycin, 12.5 milligram per kg, orally or IV, BID for two weeks after the signs resolve. Okay, it should be given for a long, long duration. Potentiated sulfur either with uh, sulfamethoxazole or uh, sulfamethoxazine, 3 milligram per kg BID should be given. Prednisolone should be given in case of um, uh, nervous signs or eye signs. Prednisolone drops, steroid drops should be given when you have keratin precipitates and anterior uveitis. So this is again uh, repeating, okay? I think... Uh, Hello. Hello. Let's face this is, you have pneumothorax, Hydrothorax, pyothorax, which always we see in some things, but we'll see what it is. Hemothorax or chylothorax, you'll see what it is. Pneumothorax is a trauma or spontaneous. Sometimes it happens because of uh, abscess or tension pneumothorax. Sometimes you will not have any uh, external injury, but still uh, you'll, uh, you'll have pneumo. So you'll have to look for places where, you know, gas could have, air could have gone into it. Sometimes you may have a esophageal tear or sometimes you will have uh, old case of uh, lung abscess, uh, you know, uh, leading on to pneumo or, you know, tension pneumothorax. Okay, all these things are pneumothorax. Usually faulty thoracosynthesis, so you should do, definitely do because I told you, once you put a needle, if it is, uh, when the fluid is totally drained, the lungs expand and then get uh, torn, okay? Perfer perforation of esophagus possibility is there by foreign bodies, faulty intubation, auto will accident, then spontaneous pneumothorax, emphysema, migrating foreign body, lung tumor, all this thing can cause a spontaneous pneumothorax. Treatment, thoracosynthesis, oxygen therapy, analgesics, chest tube placements. Tension pneumothorax, we really don't know what it is. Direct, uh, you know, causes uh, from the alveoli, inspired air goes into the chest cavity and the only way to treat is you have to make a thoracotomy and open uh, pneumothorax you have to make and then relieve the uh, tension in the chest. So hydrostatic pressure is either prehepatic or hepatic or post-hepatic. Oncotic pressure is a protein losing enteropathy or protein nephropathy. Lymphatic obstruction where you get, uh, you know, problems. Chemothorax trauma, most often tumor and sometimes coagulopathies. Any coagul most often because of rodenticide poisoning, you get hemothorax. That is uh, hemothorax. This is uh, pyothorax, where there's healed external wounds or lung abscess or bite towards cats often. And feline infectious peritonitis, you have pyothorax. Okay, this is very, very important. This case also we have seen it is, it is positive for feline infectious.
So this is a test for peritoneal uh, infectious peritonitis. It's called Rivalta. Okay, you take 10 ml of water, add uh, two to three drops of uh, acetic acid, 0.8% acetic acid, and put a drop of this uh, fluid, which you collect from the uh, cavity. If it, uh, if it gets precipitated, it is positive. If it doesn't get precipitated, it is negative. So the case which you have seen now, it is uh, positive for feline infectious peritonitis. In this case, uh, we did two cases we saw. One case we succeeded by treating a uh, ram deceiver, which we are using in uh, corona patients, in human patients, that we used for 80 days and we got a cure. The second one, we, we did try the same thing, but it failed because it had severe problem in you know, uh, doing recurrent uh, uh, thercosynthesis. So antibiotics, ampicillin, endofloxacin, clindamycin, or clinda with endofloxacin is again a good choice. Thoracosynthesis, you can do thoracic lavage, 20 ml of uh, 0.97 saline, which is warm, and uh, or ringus lactate. You soak them inside the thoracic cavity for one hour, and some of them will get absorbed. Doesn't matter, saline and ringus lactate will get absorbed, no problem. Then later on, you can drain them off during a thoracosynthesis. Intrapleural fibrolytic therapy, I have not done, but there are anecdotal reports in human medicine which you can try. Thoracostomy is not going to become all right. So chyle has got a milky fluid, limbs are fat. So accumulation of chyle in the thoracic cavity due to obstruction. Several causes in human uh, medicine, it is mainly due to tuberculosis. And uh, in dogs, usually it is due to, uh, mainly due to uh, heartworm. But the heartworm, the incidence of heartworm in India is very less. So it can be due to limb injectis here, fibrosing chloride, type chloritis. And most often in India, we get idiopathic uh, chylothorax. Sometimes you can get due to uh, DCM and uh, fungal granulomas also. So thoracosynthesis, we had a patient which came for almost three years. Once in two months, they'll come with a cyanotic mucous membrane. We'll remove the do thoracosynthesis, it become pink and go back and again come after three months. We are doing for three months. Then chest tube placement. See, this removal and all is not uh, definitive that you will not again fill in. And sudden uh, cure also is possibility. Both are a possibility in case of chylothorax. Chest tube placement, low fat diet, routine of bioflavonoid can be tried. The somatostatin, which increases water resorption so that more fluid doesn't accumulate in the thoracic cavity. Thoracic duct ligation or clarification. This can be tried. Personally, I have not tried. This also can be tried as a treatment protocol for uh, uh, chronic um, uh, plural problems. So for the benefit of uh, the veterinary uh, practitioners, uh, just use uh, you know um, antibiotics, dosage, uh, bolterella, or any antibiotic or anything is the same uh, things can be used. And the supportive medication was, you know, what is the bronchodilator, uh, how uh, sedatives and, uh, you know, put in hydrocodone, all those things uh, have given in this. Home care. This is again very important. Wherever possible, this should be definitely tried. Steam inhalation is very important. It's not a rocket science. You have a hot water uh, bath in a bathroom and after taking bath in a hot water bath, you leave the pet inside for about half an hour. That itself will uh, moisten the, the respiratory uh, sweat, which is very good for the uh, pet. Antitussis like hydrocodone, butyrophenol, uh, tramadol, and steroids can be tried. Appetite stimulants like uh, mitazapine or uh, carbromorin can be tried, or even uh, in case of uh, cats, you can try um, uh, what is that? Um, uh, Daisy palm can be tried as an appetite stimulant. Because these cats or dogs with severe respiratory, because of the problem in the plum in the nasal cavity, they don't have smell. So the olfaction is the main thing for appetite. So they will not be able to take food. So that is the main reason why we should uh, try all this appetite stimulator. Hydration is important because all the nasal secretion dries and becomes puckerings inside. So you we'll have to hydrate them either with intravenous or subcutaneous fluids and repeated uh, oral hydration. Analgesia for because of oral ulcers because it's not taking food, so you can use buprenorphine uh, 
uh, analgesia for uh, uh, severe painful oral ulcers. Oral rinses like sucralfate or lidocaine can be tried. Just uh, rinsing them, the tongue with uh, this sort of sucralfate and lidocaine can bring down the pain. Tear substitute, especially in cats, when they have a respiratory problem, they also have a dry eye. So you'll have to use tear substitutes or tear antibiotic uh, creams should be used. Okay, this is in short um, um, about respiratory tract diseases. So uh, to uh, uh, sum up, so we should know that upper respiratory tract problems, then uh, lower respiratory tract problems, then uh, lung parenchymal disease, pleural space disease. You have to group them like this. And uh, then what are the most common things which occur in a respiratory tract problem like a bra brachycephalic syndrome, uh, tracheal collapse, then uh, you have uh, uh, laryngeal paralysis. The three are very important. We should keep in mind when the animals are brought uh, with the respiratory problems. Then uh, lower respiratory tract problem, uh, bronchitis, then tracheobronchitis, kennel cough in dogs. Then in case of pneumonia, you should think about uh, cats, you should think about toxoplasma. In uh, uh, dogs, you can think about any cause of infectious reason for pneumonia. And the general uh, stay of uh, treat, treating uh, respiratory tract diseases is uh, oxygen therapy, bronchodilators, steroids, uh, nebulization, home care, which I mentioned, and a lot of alternative medicine, which can cause uh, ease to the uh, respiratory tract can be tried, uh, like, you know, this uh, uh, marijuana oil and things like that uh, can be definitely tried, okay? Thank you so much for the patient hearing. Any questions, I'll be more than happy to uh, answer.